I never forget this. I went to my team. I looked, you know, we had some people that were zooming in from out of markets because we have business in, in various states plus here. And you could just look and they had that glazed look. Like, I don't know what we're going to do. I know he's going to tell me we're, we're, we're folding. I know, we're, I know he's going to tell me I'm, I'm, I'm getting fired. I know, I know that's what he's going to tell us. And instead what they got was, hey guys, we're not going to operate in fear. We've got, I've got X number of months of operating capital. Mm-hmm. And I've got these different trip wires. So if we trip this wire, this will trigger this event. I got this trip wire that will trigger this event. I said, you guys can go home and tell your families you guys also have jobs. And you can also go home, by the way, and take the three or 400 bucks that I just deposited in your account in the morning. I want you to go to grocery stores right now and load up. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential. And I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week, I share real, tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is a serial entrepreneur who was raised in poverty, so much so that at one point he was actually homeless. But he did not let that stop him. He went on to build up multiple eight-figure businesses. Now, what I appreciate most about having the chance to speak with him is that he's not all talk. He started from nothing. He built and he lost. He's seen success and he's seen major failures. And he carries that into everything he does. Whether it's as the best-selling author of the book, The Journey Principles, or the creator of the life-changing program, Transformation You, or even as the man who helps people like you and me go from excuse land to building massive success. He believes that you are not living a life you love, not because you're not capable of it, but because you just don't know how to get there. I cannot wait to share with you the insanely inspiring talk I had with the man who can help anyone reclaim their hope and go from stuck to unstoppable, Stephen Scoggins. Uh, The place that I wanna start the conversation in is you mentioned within your bio, specifically 30 years of hardship, 30 yep. years of hardship. Um, I'm, I'm 37. I feel like I've, you know, I've run a business for 14 years. Um, I built a multi-million yep. dollar company. Um, great. You know, but, but I'm 37 and I feel more behind now than I did in my twenties. I feel that when I was <laughs> in my twenties, I had more hustle, more progress, less to lose, less at risk. Um, I was bolder. I, I was more ambitious. And, and so when I read 30 years of, 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 of hardship and everything, I go, I, like, isn't time <laughs> running out? Is it, is like, when does this get think, better? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you, you would think so. You know, I grew up in a, um, an interesting time and situation. My, uh, my grandfather survived Pearl Harbor, which started the alcohol train into my father, right? My mother had suffered a lot of physical and emotional abuse when I was younger. Um, and as a result, by the time I was like th- I think I was maybe five years old. They had already divorced and went their separate ways. And then I was raised by my grandmother. Well, that was great for like two or three years, like super, super loving, super encouraging, super like, you know, empathetic and like everything that you would want a parent to be, right? Well, she comes to me when I'm about nine, just just after I turn nine years old, she sits me down and she says, "Uh, Stephen, I need, need your help. And of course I'm nine years old. I literally, I literally have a GI Joe in one hand and a transformer in another. Right. Like I'm like, okay, you know, maybe she's gonna ask me to take out the garbage that I can barely lift. Right. So I'm thinking about through that and, you know, and then kind of go with that scenario. And then she says something that I'll never forget. She said, um, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here. I'm very sick. And even at nine years old, I was kind of like, I wasn't exactly sure what she meant. I wasn't exactly sure where she was coming from. But then she made me pull this chair over from the kitchen table when we lived in a little thousand square foot uh, brick house in Wendell, North Carolina, pulled over to the stove and she began teaching me how to make oatmeal and macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and all this kind of stuff. And my brother was three at the time. No, I'm sorry. My brother was six at the time. I had to get him up and get him dressed and all kinds of stuff. And that was essentially the start 
of what I refer to as a massive uphill battle my entire life. Um, now, being where I am now versus where I came from, I'm incredibly thankful that was my journey. Incredibly thankful. It has taught me a different level of empathy when people are going through various struggles. It, my dad and mom came back into the picture about the time she passed, you know, which is about a year, year and a half later. Chemo got the best of her. She had cancer. You know, so my lifeline, my stability, my safety net, well, that was the first time I can remember it actually being yanked out from under me. That was the one time that I had the hardest time recovering. It took me several years. I had to repeat the fifth grade and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, from that standpoint, I went to go live with my dad. You know, and when I went to go live with him, I went into the construction industry immediately. Every, every Saturday, every Sunday, every holiday, every weekend, that's where I was at, working, carrying studs yes. for a dollar, you know, a dollar an I hour. Love it. But, uh, you know, it's funny. The, what, the one thing the construction industry taught me growing up throughout it was it taught me how to use my hands, which taught me how to use my head, which now I get to use my heart. I was very fortunate that it forced me to face things that I didn't want to face. It forced me to face fears I didn't want to face. I mean, all of that stuff. And that's when I met my first mentor. I was probably 13 or 14 years old. He was my dad's employer. And I remember him, he used to drive around this Jeep Grand, uh, white Jeep Grand Cherokee, right? Mm -hmm. And they always had a dent in the right-hand rear bumper because the dude was forever backing into stuff. And he would just get the bumper replaced and he would do it like a month later and whatever. You know, he was in his like maybe 70s at the time. He had perfect dentures, perfect big white smile and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, but he he took a liking to me and I never understood why until he, he put me in his car to talk to me. I was remember I was working on my dad's framing crew. It was hot as Hades outside. And I was like, he's got the AC on. I don't care if it smells like mothballs or not. I'm getting inside and I'll sit in there as long as he wants to talk to me. Don't care what he tells me about. Well, I'll never forget this because he, he sits me down and he goes, did you know your grandfather, I used to work for your grandfather? I'm like, no. Hmm. Did you know your grandfather taught me the construction business? No. Hmm. Well, your grandfather is the best carpenter in this state, hands down. And he said he would be a multimillionaire 10 times over, be far wealthier than I ever would have been if he had just stopped drinking. Stephen, I've watched the duty go from your grandfather to your daddy. And that's how he, that's how he taught, right? Your daddy. <laughs> I remember that. He goes, I don't want it to happen to you. You work hard. You're smart. You deserve more and you deserve better. I'm like, uh, you know, again, I'm like a teenager, you know, early teens. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, all right. And then he goes, he goes, I want you to hear me out. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to give me an honest answer. I said, yes, sir. All right. He said, what's the difference between a rich man and a poor man? I'm like, well, duh, money, right? Dude, if he could have slapped me in the back of my head, I think he would have, right? Because I'm like, you know, I was like, duh. I mean, what do I know? You know, I know, but all I know is poverty, kind of more or less, or paycheck to paycheck scenario. And he goes, no, the difference between a rich man and a poor man in every, any area of their life is the way they think. You can choose to think like me or you can choose to think like your daddy. And you got to decide now, not when you're 50. And I was like, man, it stunned me. And then he says, I also want you to remember this. You got to be willing to do today what others won't so you can have tomorrow what others don't. Now, here, now here's the contrast. Not even a week earlier, I remember my father, we were on a job site and I was telling my dad about my big dream to become a professional ninja. <laughs> like, if you want to be, I seriously wanted to be a professional martial arts ninja guru because, like, I idolized Bruce Lee and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it so seems I like all that the to furthest kind of, thing for a little boy in North Carolina, man. You know, I, I don't know. I grew up throwing, throwing stars and nunchucks. I don't know. But, uh, you know, and he, he laughed it off and he goes, and I'll never forget this because this is like a week before. He says, Steven Scoggins don't get ahead. They just get by. I'm like, I feel like I'm meant for more than that. Hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know what that is. I mean, I wasn't thinking entrepreneurship. I wasn't thinking owning companies. I wasn't thinking of developing teams or leading. I didn't know how to lead myself, let alone believe in myself. And that, that conversation and that conversation collided right at the same time. Hmm. 
And that's when I actually started reaching out and started reading. You know, the problem was, is because my household was always unstable financially. We were fraught. We were always getting the lights turned off and the cockroaches in the, in the mobile home we were in and all kinds of stuff. And my dad had a, had a successful company and then unfortunately went through a downturn in the late nineties or about mid nineties during the Gulf war and some stuff like that. And we went through all that and we lost everything, foreclosures, repossessions, all of it, you know, and I, I watched my dad work his absolute butt off. I mean, absolute butt off, 18 hour days, day after day after day, never stopping, but he never could actually quote unquote, get ahead, right? He kept making bad financial decision after bad financial decision after bad financial decision. And then he make a bad relational decision after a bad relational, like it was like this influx of like every single area of life I watched him struggle with. And as his oldest son, all I wanted to take it away from him, take it off of him. And right, because I, I would do watch. Think, do you, was was the was the um, alcoholism a side effect of something bigger or deeper or some kind of mental health issue, or or in your mind, you know, the well, alcohol I think it started was. Started with my. I think the alcohol started with my dad specifically as a way to fit in when he was younger, mm. right? Because you know, he's when he was going to school. You remember remember the the uh, grease lightning days. Well, that's his hair, right? So the, you know, the leather coats and the slick back hair, and you're either a prep or a jock or a or grease, right? So I mean, that was kind of his thing. And, you know, I remember him getting, he, he tells a story about his, his first, uh, not his first car, but I think his third car was like a, a 68 Camaro with white interior. And he's like, you know, and how he wanted to be like fast off the line and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's where it started. And then it got intensified when he joined the Marine Corps. Right. So he, he, he went all the way through the ranks, got to about the place of what they refer to as a gunny sergeant. And he wore, so he, he, you know, was stationed at uh, Paris Island as well as Camp Lejeune at different points in time. And I don't know if you've ever been to those areas, United States, but they are relatively uneventful. So what do you do with, with jacked up Marines, right. That are being trained to, you know, to the hilt, not giving them any kind of outlet. Well, they go hang out at the bar. The drink you know, and shoot, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so, you know, it's, you know, so it's, you know, it's kind of like, I think that's kind of where it started. Now my mother on the other hand was a little bit different. My other, my mother on the other hand actually had a dysfunctional family after my grandparents had separated and divorced. My, uh, my grandmother who raised me, uh, my mother's mother spent a lot of time, unfortunately, uh, trying to fill the void of the husband that she lost mm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, as a result, she would attract different men. Of course, I didn't know this. I didn't know this until I was well into my 30s. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't understand why my mom struggled to be a mother to me for so long until I understood where her influences came from, right? So we went through that process. And as I, I discovered that my, my grandmother wasn't great with money, my grandmother actually struggled with alcoholism, which I didn't know because I never saw her drink when she was with me. Turns out she stopped drinking the day I was, I was born and referred to me as her second chance. Mm. Isn't it weird strange? Family. I mean, you, you talked about empathy, but isn't it strange how as you get older with more perspective and, and you realize that everybody's just doing the best that they can and you think they got yeah. it all figured out and then you hit, you know, the same age. I remember the moment, you know, my, my mom and dad divorced uh, or separated the week I was born. You know, my dad mm. left the week I was born. And so I was never raised in a type of household with with two parents like that so it, it i didn't i didn't lose anything or mourn anything for that mm -hmm. but you know i i i hit the age i have four kids when we had my second child so we we had a daughter and then a son i have an older sister and then and yeah. then you know i'm the, the son same age difference same everything yeah. and when my son was born something something really got me angry it yeah. got me angry because i looked at him in the hospital and I turned to my wife and I said, this is the moment that my dad decided to leave, <laughs> right? Like two-year-old daughter, baby in my hands. This is, this is the moment. And then I had to address it with him and I had to talk to him about it and I had to work through it and all of that stuff. But, but you talked about empathy. I find the struggle is, is as I get older, I become more aware and I become more empathetic to certain situations. And at the same time, I become less sympathetic as well. How do you balance yeah. that, that level of empathy with also the fact that, you know, sometimes you got to push through. Sometimes you got to be hard. Sometimes you got to cut people off. Yeah. Sometimes the empathy doesn't help. How do you balance that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I always, I always lead with empathy, but then 
kind of back it up with understanding. And here's what I mean by that. So I came at a point in my life, I was probably, probably 28 or 29. My first company um, that I built from the ground up was doing decently well. And I was getting the phone calls and the, uh, you know, the answering machine version of the phone calls long before we had these technology devices everywhere, right? And um, my mom would ask me, why don't you ever come over? Why don't you ever come over? Come see me, come see me. You know, just she was being a typical mom. And I would go spend time with her. And, you know, and unfortunately, every time I went to spend time with her in that, that season, it was, it was always a discussion about how bad life was for her, right? You know, kind of almost like the victim kind of mindset a little bit. A, a pity party. <laughs> yeah, it was a pity party, right? And then there's and there's a couple of things that I won't share publicly that she chose to do that directly affected me, um, that gave me every every right to be very angry, be distant, all that kind of stuff. Problem was, is I was carrying that with me, which was harming me, and it wasn't allowing me to even potentially connect with her. So here's what happened. I had a buddy of mine who's also um, in the influencer space. His name's Chris Licurdo. Um, in fact, I need to introduce you guys for sure. And I was, I met him through the Dave Ramsey organization. I'm good friends with their organization. And um, he doesn't work there anymore, but he used to. And I remember him talking about his mom and about how he had to heal from his mom and all this kind of stuff. And so I was very inquisitive. I was like, well, how did you do that? Like, he goes, it was simple. He said, I finally realized that every parent, has never been actually trained to be a parent other than the parents that they were visibly associated with. And I was like, Hmm, I've never thought of it that way. Right. Cause up until that time I was just judging my mom, my mom and my dad, every time they made a mistake. Right. Well, then he took a step further. He goes, if you truly want to get healing and restore all those relationships and you truly want to work through that, here's what I want you to do from now on. He says, now he and I are both people of faith. So, take what I'm about to say with a little bit of grain of salt. And in that, he said, I want you to start to realize that there's a creator that loves her just as much as they love you. And rather than view her as this villain, what if you actually viewed her as the child with skin up knees that's simply asking for a parent to pick them up? Mm -hmm. The crazy part was, is like, I had to ponder on that for probably a solid month, but in the moment, it instantaneously unlocked like this weeping fit out of me. I just started crying like crazy, you know, because all of that judgment, all of that burden, all of that stuff, I was saying, it's all your fault, right? And then as I began to change my perspective, shift my beliefs a little bit, even in that moment, it was like a weight lifted off me. And then I was able to go back to her and begin to rebuild a relationship with her and actually teach her the same thing I was just taught. Mm -hmm. So my mother is now walking around in freedom where she used to be walk around and uh, walking around with chains on, so to speak. You can either choose to become the person that your parents have been, right? Because there's a good chance you're going to marry one of your parents. There's a high likelihood statistically, right? And you're good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then you're going to become one of them. As well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, or you can look at their mistakes, learn those lessons, apply those new principles, and heal from those things and actually be the thing that cuts the quote unquote bondage, if you will, right? I don't know if any a better word to say it. This, you know, uh, for example, um, you ever done the, have you done anything with ancestry.com? Like you ever like gone down the rabbit hole of like, all right, so I have. Okay. Well, they have this thing that's called uh, the ancestry DNA kit. So I went I down the was rabbit hole. Just first. Talking to someone about this this morning, yeah. because on my dad's side, we don't know anything about our family past um, my dad. Like we just, we just don't yeah. know anything above that. And so I was just talking, I got to do this DNA test. <laughs> yeah. So I did, I did it like a year ago. We're Scandinavian. So technically I'm, I'm part Viking, which is kind of funny because I'm like five foot nothing. And, uh, and then we have, uh, then we have the Southern tip of Scotland, the Northern tip of Ireland, uh, and then Denmark and Wales. So that's, that's the thing. Okay. So I went as far back in my dad's tree to discover how the Scoggins quote unquote came to be inside of the United States of America. It turns out my family was sent here on a penal. <laughs> and, but here's, but here's the thing. The reason I'm bringing this up is because 
they got arrested, prosecuted, and put on a boat to come to, to basically become indentured servants, if you will, mm -hmm. um, here to, to the United States or what became the United States, because they were trying to feed their family and they sh and they basically killed a deer on on a lord's land. So I've had hundreds of years of poverty, hundreds of years of you know, we don't get by or we don't get ahead, we get by. Like hundreds of years where that's been, and I remember this, I, I was, I'm, again, I, I, I spent this time praying. It's one of the things I like to do. And I did this when I was like 13 or 14. I was, sitting, I was in the trailer park that we had to move into after my dad lost his business um, that Steve Myrick actually owned. So Steve Myrick actually owned this mobile home park, all of the, you know, all the, all the units and, and allowed us to move into one. And I had this like surreal, somber moment. Where I just thought I was going to go for a walk. It was a fall night, stars out everywhere. I'm sort of, I, don't, I don't know. I, just felt, I almost feel like I'm being called out of the, the mobile home. I walk down the street go, and go all the way down to the park, which is probably a good six blocks from the place my dad stayed in. And out of nowhere, I, just, I was just staring at the stars. And then literally, I, I just found myself like kneeling down and saying, there's got to be more to life than this. I don't care what it takes, what needs to happen, what I need to do differently. I want to be the one to break this family. And I used, and in that moment, not knowing any better, I actually used the word curse. Two things happen. First of all, I'm very thankful that I actually asked for that. Second of all, I did not understand what I was asking for. How hard. Okay. Is Cause yeah, dude. To break through all this crap, right? I had to face homelessness. I had to face a suicide attempt. I had to face all the failure and all the limiting beliefs and all the junk that come along with generations of not believing you can measure up or become something more, become stronger and better. I had to face um, my attraction to toxic relationships because that's what I witnessed, right? It's like I walked around with a big L on my head saying, please date me please date me. Right. I had to face all that stuff. And as a result, now I get to sit here and, and, and have this conversation with you. Hopefully that somebody's going to take something away from this and actually go have their own moment where they're saying, let me be the one, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to hurt, but it's going to be so, so worth it. The so, life that I live now, dude. Oh, so let, if I, only if I if I can ask two questions, one, can I circle back on the, 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 I understand the, the polarity of the two moments, you know, the conversation yep. with your dad and a week later having this conversation, was it actually a choice? And is it a choice that you had to make over and over and over again? Because you were tempted to regress and to go back and to give up and this and that. Or were you actually built for this and it wasn't a choice? It's actually coming natural to you. You just needed someone to show you to connect the dots. Because if it's a choice, it can be taught and learned. And if it's yep. inherent to you, then you, you got really lucky. <laughs> I think habits are inherent, but choices are chosen. As strange as that sounds. So what I mean by that is, Yes, I had Steve Mark. Yes, I had Susan Bass. Yes, I had uh, Dave Ramsey and John Maxwell and all these other people lead me along the way that I've actually had the, the distinct honor of and pleasure of spending one-on-one -on -one time with these people over and over again, right? That's, that's a rare opportunity. I never take that for granted. At the same time, I did have to make the initial choice, okay, which was the, yes, I'm going to do this, but I did regress several times. Right. I had that conversation with Steve as a young teenager, but yet, you know, 19 years old, I find myself sleeping outside and sleeping in cars and just trying to figure out where I'm getting food from and shelter from. Right. But right? how do you so, not go? You told me it wouldn't be this hard. <laughs> you told me all I had to right? do was just, you know, not be like my dad. And now look at me. Yeah. I, you know, for me, it's, it's always come down to four different phases and a lot of reflection time. And I don't, I don't think people do enough reflection time. I think, I think people, when they do reflect, they judge and condemn themselves. Like I made this mistake. This is who I am. Like they tie their identity to their mistakes. And because they tie their identity to their mistakes, they can't actually tie their identity to their strengths. 
There's, they're, they're so focused on looking in the rear view mirror that they're like, sorry, say that again, say that again for me. Yeah. I mean, they're just, they're so focused on their mistakes that they're not focused on their strengths. And as a result, they don't get to Mm. move forward. You know, it's, it's like, it's like driving a car wanting to go from here and I'm in North Carolina to California. So coast to coast, but never looking in forward, always looking like this. Like you can't look backwards and right. keep the car on the road. Right. And when I began like really studying myself, I really, you know, one of the things that um, irks me and I think, I think it, when I, Evan and I were chatting not long ago, I think it kind of irks him too, but right. So, cause he, re, he, he, like, he has this thing where he says that you're one of the good guys. I'm like, what does that even mean? Cause like people kept telling me that, like, what, what does that mean? I know what that right? means. I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so, if he said you're one of the good guys, he didn't even tell me that. That means you're one of the good guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, but so here's how I took it. There is a world full of quote unquote gurus, mm-hmm. but nobody wants to be a guide. So there's all this theology. There's all this philosophical behavior. There's all these 10 ways to do this and three ways to do that and five ways to do this and six different ways to do that and three different ways to do this. And you know, here's the, the five top 10 ninja hack secrets for mindset and like all these different buzzwords. Right. And I can't say, I can't really say anything. Some of my videos are named that way, <laughs> but the, at the end of the day, it's because people don't want to guide. So what I thought I would do differently is I thought that maybe, maybe the change would be if I could break things down at the end of the day, I've been trying to summarize these things. And I came down to this, what I refer to as the four phases of transformation. And you can't skip them and you can't do them out of order, but if you'll do them repetitively over time, the choices are actually made for you. So your routines actually reinforce the pl- the person you're trying to be, not the person that you are. And the first phase is, I just call it gain perspective, right? So you look at things from as many possible different angles as you possibly can, ask as many questions as you can about your identity, about how you were built, about where you came from, about your parents, about your friends, about your economy, about your environment, your geographical location. Like spend time with a pen and a pad and ask as many possible questions that you can possibly do that. Jot down all your answers and then go to the top three people that are closest to you and do the same thing over again. Hey, what do you see? Mm-hmm. Right? Because we don't objectively see ourselves. We see ourselves by our actions. While other, I'm sorry. We see ourselves by our intentions. While other people see us by our actions or our outcomes. Right? The next phase is to actually recognize and remove a roadblock. All right. So case in point, one of my main roadblocks in, in, in becoming the person I am today was getting past this thing where I felt like I was worthy, worthy and valued enough to actually experience a life that I was dreaming about. Now, a lot of us will have, dream about the life we want, mm-hmm. but then we tell ourselves all the reasons why we can't have it. Yep. Right. Seriously. Like, and then, and then you start to think when well, then you start to make progress and then you're like, oh, da, 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 da. and then somebody says, well, you're not, you're, you're not who you think you are. And all of a sudden you go, I guess I'm an imposter. You have to understand where it comes from and rip it up by its root. It could be a number of different things, okay? But if you can gain enough perspective to recognize what those things are, then you can remove them. Most people don't actually take the time to recognize them in the begin with, which is why they keep biting them in the butt. That kind of like shifts how you look at just how you assess yourself and then how you assess yourself on a regular basis to keep yourself forward. The third one, everybody and their brother talks about all the time. In 50,000 different ways, I don't care what influencer you're listening to or what pod, let's organize a plan. Where do you want to go? What are your opportunities and what are your threats? I believe that nobody does it because no one comes alongside of other people as a guide or a mentor and says, this is how you do it, Hmm. right? We can say, set it out, you know, what are your goals? Well, I want to make a million dollars. Okay, well, you need to make 10 first, right? You know, there's this, there's this... There's this fear of not taking action simply because you don't know any better. Like for the longest time, I didn't want to touch anything or take any step forward or got to go move forward in any way, shape or form until somebody said, Hey, you're going to make mistakes and it's okay. Yes. Like it's okay. Like it's okay. You're going to, I am, I'm convinced I sit in the seat that I am sitting today, not because of my successes, but because of my failures that taught me something. 
right? We look at failure as final all the time and we shouldn't. I know it's cliche, but we shouldn't look at failure as final. It is an opportunity to learn. Either you learn or you win. It's one of the two. You know, when you look at the, the, the final phase, which is work your plan, just, which is just putting in the work, right? All right, so there's, at this time of this recording, <clears throat> you and I are like everybody else in the country. We've, we're facing COVID. We're tired of hearing about COVID. We're tired of having to argue about masks and who's doing what or whatever. And Hold on. I'm in Canada. So we, we, don't, we don't argue. Like COVID about is there. No, we don't huh? argue about masks. We all just put them all right, on. Well, you're lucky. Um, all right, so no my one... country is not argue about masks. <laughs> so. We just do what we're told by the government. The government says do it. We go, okay, we do it. I, th I think we did that at first, and then now, now it's getting a little like, come on, dude. But anyway, in this particular environment, um, you know, the, the, the U.S. economy was doing going like gangbusters, right, for several years on a row, okay? Well, I weathered the 2008 downturn, which was, you know, for the U.S. economy, which is all housing, right? So, and hence, I was in the construction industry, and I was one of the last guys standing. And at the end of the downturn in 2008, because I had been putting, I put those principles into place and began using those principles over and over, it became second nature. It's like um, muscle memory. You, when you do martial arts and you, you do certain techniques over and over again, it becomes like crazy automatic. Same thing happens in life. Same thing happens in business. I don't remember which, which person said this, but obviously they said uh, success leaves clues or leaves footsteps or something like that, right? Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Okay. Success right, shout out to Tony. Clues. Tony. <laughs> yep. You know, and it, if you follow the clues, you, you, you know, you it's Hansel and Gretel had to follow the crumbs, right? It's the same, it's the same stinking thing, right? It's the same hero's journey over and over again. You, you are where you are. You got to face something that you never thought you'd face. You have to, get stronger. I mean, it's Rocky Balboa. It's Luke Skywalker. It's like every single hero that you know, right? There's this massive adversity that you face, and then you get to go through the transformational moment all over again. And then best what you get to start all over again, right? Go to the next level. Seriously. I mean, that's, that's, that's essentially what it is, right? Well, most people are living by the wrong movie. So if you change the way you think, you'll change the way you act. You change the way you act, you change the way you get results right? Most people don't want to look at that stuff. They're so ill. I, I don't have enough money to get around. I'm tired of crying in my pillow again because I, because you know, the, the one I, and I just broke up, right? Not realizing that all of that stuff can actually be prevented. Here's what I mean by that. So you go, so you, in the U S economy, our guy shut down the, our, our government as a whole unified, all of them, all the knuckleheads shut down the entire country. The one thing that I did differently than other business owners that are currently struggling is I began preparing for a COVID-like experience long before COVID was ever here. Why everybody else is saying, let's run with the bulls. Let's run with the bulls. You know, the whole bull market thing. The bulls here, the bulls here. Let's, let's get it. Let's get it. I was going, okay, bulls here. That's awesome. Let's make sure we take enough advantage of it. But let's also realize that there's always a bear that follows the bull. Mm-hmm. Right, so my company's right of debt. I had, gosh, six or eight months of operating capital in the bank, okay? So when everybody else was like, okay, we're shutting down. And I'm not, and I'm not taking away from business owners that struggle, because I, I mean, I, I have been there, which is how I learned the lesson. So I'm, this is the lesson they probably need to learn, right? This is, this is how you learn that lesson, right? Be prepared. In fear, they're laying off people left and right, all kinds of stuff. And then they're beholden to the, any kind of stimulus and all this kind of stuff. I was prepared. And as a result of being prepared and having cash on hand, not being in debt, not being leveraged, owning my, my properties, my live event, like the, one of your early questions, was like, is it choice? Like, what is it? Is it choice? Is it, is it something that you get luck into? Yes, it's choice. It's you choosing on a daily basis to live by principles in life and business that are predictable in that they always bring results. Albeit, many of those results happen slowly over time. Mm -hmm. Impatience is what ends up basically becoming catastrophic. That's my opinion. I, I've, I've got to say it, it's interesting because we've, so I started my business in 2006, mm -hmm. very, very small, $7,000 of capital service-based yep. business so I could do. So I was only 23 at the time. Didn't know what I was doing, but let me tell you, 2009 was not fun for us. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. ate through all of the cash on hand, had a three month period with no work, no invoicing, nothing. Mm -hmm. I found 
uh, maybe about a year ago, I found my daily journal of, yeah. uh, for like April 2009 or something. And it said, um, on number one, it was like, finally a paying client. Like it was like April. Um, but, but I have been, that, that scared me so much that I had, I am, I'm anti-debt as well. I'm not super bullish. And so for the last three or four years, I've been actually kicking myself for slowing our growth down mm -hmm. and going and, and, and speaking with my controller and saying, I don't understand. Like people are taking money from here to pay over here and they're leveraged and all of this stuff. Yeah. I can't even think this way. Why are we, why aren't we more aggressive? Why aren't we leveraging capital and resources the way that we leverage people? Like, like this is killing our growth. And, and yet then when this all happened, I was like, Oh, Oh, okay. That's why. Um, my, this is my, a reminder. Yeah, oh, this, this is why my conservative yeah. nature uh, is actually paying yeah. off. Because, yeah, I mean, listen, 2010 to yeah. 2020 was a 10-year run where for four years, I'm like, oh, recession's coming every seven years. Typically, on like yeah. cyclical recession's coming and, and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then going like, am I just the fool? Like, am I the, am I the fool because I'm wasting time and I'm not leveraging finances well enough? And I'm... You know, yep. I'm not this and I'm not that. And so hearing other business owners, because because you talked about the fact that construction isn't sexy for Forbes. Well, yep. when you're fo focused on an entrepreneur podcast or scaling podcast or growth podcast or whatever it is, nobody wants to hear that you built it very, very slowly without yep. financing. Um, yep. you know, like nobody wants to hear that story. Maybe that's, maybe that's why I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's true. I mean, look, there's a, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm sure even listening right now, that they have a dream, they have a goal, they've, they've got, they're, they're out there doing it. Maybe they're six months in, maybe they're a year in, and they're, and they're at this decision stage where a bank is like, no, seriously, let me lend you money. No, seriously. You can get a nicer piece of equipment, a nicer toy. You can we get brand new servers. Like, and Don't do it, man. Don't do it. I, don't do it. I mean, there's, there's no reason to do it. Just, just be consistent. Right. Shoot. When, when these downturns and stuff happen, if you're consistent and you're putting money away when, you know, for a rainy day kind of thing, some would call it an emergency fund. Some would call it just savings, right? You're, maybe it's in a money market. So it's making a little interest. It's not going to be a lot, but it's at least it's something, right? Then when the things like this happen and they will happen over and over and over again, why? Because people are dumb. I don't, and I don't mean, I, I mean, we're, we make, we make, right? You were talking about the economies and how they, they're cyclical and every seven years, like it's fear that drives the spending habits. Anytime someone's scared, watch the stock market. Mm -hmm. Like it's a big yo-yo. All right. Mm -hmm. You can choose not to participate in that stuff. You can like, I, I remember, I remember this, I got, um, gosh, a little over 400 team members in one of the companies that I'm, you know, and people that were, yeah. You know, and then one of the, um, one of the, one of the, uh, I had this, you know, COVID, COVID happened. They made the announcement, Hey, we're going to start in a state started shutting down slowly. You know, we were one of the last ones to kind of get shut down, which I guess we're also one of the last ones to open. So for that matter, but, um, you know, that whole thing began, I never forget this. I went to my team. I looked, you know, we had some people that were zooming in from out of markets because we have business in, in various States plus here. And you could just look and they had that glazed look. Like, I don't know what we're going to do. I know he's going to tell me we're, we're, we're folding. I know, I know he's going to tell me I'm, I'm, I'm getting fired. I know, I know that's what he's going to tell us. And instead what they got was, Hey guys, we're not going to operate in fear. We've got, I've got X number of months of operating capital mm -hmm. and I've got these different trip wires. So if we trip this wire, this will trigger this event. I got this trip wire that will trigger this event. I said, you guys can go home and tell your families. You guys also have jobs and you can also go home by the way and take the three or 400 bucks that I just deposited in your account in the morning. And I want you to go grocery stores right now and load up. <laughs> Buy that toilet paper. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. Toilet paper and the water and like, you know, I don't know But anyway, you know, North Carolina is weird about water, toilet paper and milk <laughs> and bread. But uh, you know, it's, you know, but it, 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 it removed the fear, but I made those decisions that had those outcomes years ago. How can you, lay the groundwork by choice now that is reinforced by a principle based behavior that gives you the outcome to pivot when you need to pivot. 
Because if you're not thinking ahead, you're going to get left behind over and over again. It just, it happens. It's, it's cyclical, right? Building a business doesn't have to be difficult as long as you're consistent. It's not like you're going to have not have days when things don't work out and you don't, you lose a customer or you don't, maybe you're mad at a customer and you want to have a verbal. Well, if you can take fear out of each one of those situations, then you're able to operate when nobody else can. So anytime that you grow, there's Mm -hmm. tension. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you, you mentioned when you were 19, you know, the movie reel and what have you, you know, I was having a conversation uh, one month ago today with Evan, my, you know, our, our mutual friend, Evan Carmichael. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, you know, I'm very good friends with him. He's been pushing me very hard for the last few years. And I said to That's him, only he can do. what's that? That is only he can do. <laughs> yeah. That's only he well, can do. I get, I get a very unique version of it that I'm very grateful for most of the time, but um, basically everything was like a month ago, everything, a lot of things were crumbling around me. Um, And I've been able to rebuild and repair and whatnot since then. But, but, but I like, I'm talking to him and while I'm talking, I get this text, which is like from someone, which is kind of like a linchpin, right? Like, like they're like a domino person when they fall, everything else kind of falls around. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, I said, you know, dude, if you didn't push me so hard, I wouldn't have any of the problems that I'm facing right now. Mm. And, and what I meant was, if I was living a smaller life, and if I was, I may be unhappy, but I'm unhappy now too. But at least I was ignorantly unhappy back then and not dealing with yeah. all of this stress and pressure and all yeah. of these things. Thanks, Evan, for pushing me to be better. Now I get to deal with harder things. Like, thanks so much <laughs> for, for, for me now having to deal with even tougher things. Like maybe I was happier back then living ignorant and, and unhappy versus oh, self-aware and unhappy. And he was like, screw yeah. you, Mark. Do you know, like, he's like, he's like, we're friends, but do you know the gift that I've given you? Do you know how hard, um, you know, I've pushed you? Do you know how much time I've put into it? And now you're going to say like this to me? And I said it in jest, but there is some truth to it. Like if he hadn't pushed me, I wouldn't be dealing with any of the things that I'm dealing with now. And so in your life, struggle after struggle, challenge after challenge, what I struggle with is knowing in the back of my mind, I feel like if at any point I just give up, things would be easier. I can't give up. I don't know why I can't give up on on things. But I really go like, I'm always just like, you know, what? if I just gave up, things would be so much easier. Have you found in, you know, the embezzlement or the struggles or the businesses or the <laughs> the staff or the, like, don't you ever just want to give up? There have been numerous times where I wanted to give up. And here's what would happen. Um, I would literally go to bed that night thinking I'm done. I'm done. I'm just, I'm exhausted. Uh, I've been betrayed. I've, I've been giving. No one cares. You know, I, I, I've, I've, I'm a proponent of taking really good care of your team, loving on them, mentoring them, all that kind of stuff. And I found that just getting rest recharged me just enough to take another step, just enough to take another step. And then I had this interesting epiphany about two years ago while going through the embezzlement stuff is that no one climbs a mountain without their legs getting stronger. And you can stay in the valley of life or you can operate from the peaks. Now, as soon as you get to one peak, there's going to be another peak that you see on the horizon. After right? the mountain is a mountain. Exactly. And, I, and then I decided, the other thing that I decided is, you know, after I, you know, because when you, when you go back and look at your life and you're able to see that this thing happened, it should have taken me out, but it didn't. And then this thing happened, and it should have taken me out and didn't. And then this thing happened, and it should have taken me out and then didn't. What you see is when you have the tenacity and the willingness to learn from mistakes, from people, from mentors, that you truly become unstoppable, mm-hmm. right? So we use a slang term called stuck to unstoppable, right? We, we help people go from stuck to unstoppable. And, you know, especially in the first one, we were first started talking like that. People were like, hey, that's cute. It's nice, you know, whatever. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Are you making the progress you want to make right now? Yes or no? Well, no. Why? Why aren't you? And they give you, I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't have the relationships. I don't have this. I don't have this. I don't have that. And I'm like, what if you 
just went out and tried to serve somebody. Right? What if that created momentum to move you forward? Because I had this another inch. I have lots of interesting epiphanies. Um, one of the epiphanies that I had was the greatest purpose you can ever have in, in life is serving the person you used to be. And I think Evan even put that in his recent book, um, something along those lines, like, like the same wording, which means there's, this is a, to me, that tells me that means it's a life truth, mm -hmm. right? Rather than looking at your adversity as a stumbling block or something that's going to hold you back or whatever, instead look at it like the Navy SEALs buds camp, Right. Lifting logs, getting, doing the push-ups, getting drowned underwater, being brought back to life, learning how to be a sniper, like all that stuff. Making that shift, understanding that as trials came and didn't take me out, I was going to get stronger, prepared me for the next level, which is what you just got through saying, right? That means it's a life truth, right? If the longer you're looking for bliss and utopia and stuff like that, the further it's, it's going to be from you. Because what happens is you go through a growth cycle and then you get a bliss cycle. You get to, you get the, you get to experience the fruit of that work that you did here and that, and the sacrifice and the fears you face and the limiting beliefs you face, you get, you get to that point. Right. And then for another six months, you get to go, maybe you get to go buy the nice car. Maybe you get to go out and do the nice thing and go to the nice travel and right. The tricky part is not getting lost, like not losing yourself in the wind or in the struggle. The tricky part is understanding that you cannot have one without the other. It's the yin and yang, right? Peace, harmony, joy, contentment, hope, all of that stuff is found in the center, right? Why is it that people in uh, third world countries can make a soccer ball out of leaves and be totally happy, but yet we get totally depressed if someone doesn't give us, give us enough likes on Facebook? Mm -hmm. We want to harm ourselves because someone you, told us they didn't love us. At Starbucks, they spell your name wrong on the cup. <laughs> exactly. How, how dare they, right? You know, yeah. it's just like, come on. Like, you're not looking at life with the right lens. You're looking at life through the lens that everybody tells you you should be looking through. The most successful people on the planet do exactly what Steve Merrick taught me to do years and years and years and years ago. They think different. Look at your struggles as a tool to propel you forward, not to hold you back, not to take you out, not to keep you in fear, not to lose all hope. Okay. Because the strength that comes in reclaiming your hope, like taking saying that's mine. You can't have it. I own it. And you're going to have lots of people who are going to come in your back pocket and try to take it out of your, take it out of your back pocket. Right. You get to choose about whether or not you release that or not. You are going to face difficult stuff. It's going to happen, okay? And the further you want to go, the more difficult things are going to happen, okay? At the same time, if you want to have a legacy that outlives you, okay, then you have to do something that's going to affect change long after you're gone, right? I built a construction company. Fantastic. Yay me, right? I got great team members, okay? My gift is not the fact that I built a multi-million dollar business. That's, that's what maybe some of the, maybe the world would say, hey, this is awesome, like he's, oh, whatever. That's not important. What's important to me is how did I lead that team? Do they have more opportunities to better their lives and better their family because I, because I, was, their, because I was one of the leaders? Was I worthy of being followed? Was, was my character and my integrity and my passion, was it so succinct that, they had never had a doubt that they should just keep going. When they went through struggles, did they have me to say, hey, look, keep going. You got this. Come on. Just another, just one more step. Just one more step. I know it hurts. I know your legs are burning. I know you want to give up. I know you do. I know you don't feel like you can breathe. I know it. I know. I, I've been there. I know. Just do it. Trust me. Trust me. Just please trust me. Right? That created what, we're, what I'm walking into now. Right? is this ability to affect in lives at impact at scale. Rory, a good friend of mine, Rory Vaden, um, he builds a lot of, he, he helps a lot of people build a lot of personal brands. He helps them get clear and, and even helped me with mine to a degree. Um, actually helped me a lot, to be honest. One of the things that he, um, he shares with people a lot in building personal brands is he says, what's the one thing that you've earned, earned the right to talk about? 
Earn's a big word. I used Earn to imply say, sacrifice. So, so I, I, I do brand strategy within my, with, with people. And I always say that if you want to go to market with something, nobody is waiting for you to show up. No one is like, oh, thank goodness you're here. I was, <laughs> I, I needed your services and, and here yeah. you are, right? And so yeah. earn is the perfect word because it's not mm -hmm. only what you have to earn the right to talk about, you have to earn existence and attention yeah. and, and um, uh, uh, like a, you have to earn the right for people's attention. You have to earn so much and then deliver on that yeah. and so on. So that, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I've been so thankful for people like Evan and Bo and some of the other people that we're definitely you know, mutually connected with is because I've been trying to do this, what you and I are doing right now, which is just share my heart, share my experiences, and hopefully you know, drop some value where somebody can just one nugget that they can keep them moving forward for five years trying to cut through the noise, five years trying to cut through the clutter, five years saying, hey, look, I've actually done it. I'm not just talking like, you know, like, let me, here, here's my playbook. Here's how I did it. Like, I'll walk with you. Let's, let's, let's talk together. Like, let's reason together. Right. And it's hard, but it's supposed to be. Why am I going to get mad if another speaker gets chosen over me for a different event? Okay. That's fine. Shouldn't affect how I perceive in going after, going after, going to market or going to help people because I'm actually wanting to help people. Right. And one of the things that you learn, I know that um, the three of us, Evan, myself, and you have all shared this, once you get to the place where you've earned an income that's like really more than, you know, I, I don't mean, and I use this loosely to kind of know what to do with, so to speak. It's, you know, you've, you've, you've earned the right and the respect to, to steward wealth. Let's put it that way. You learn that it's empty. It's totally empty. Okay. I got a nice house. Okay. I got a, I got a nice, this, I got a nice, this. And you look around, you're like, is this, is this what my life measures up to? Mm -hmm. Interesting fun fact. So top 1%, okay, have eight to 12 mastery level skills at any given genre. Okay. Tony Robbins, good example. Okay. Tony Robbins has mastered the business in the life mastery space. Like he's the, he is the godfather that set the stage for a lot of us other knuckleheads. Okay. It just, it is right. And like him or hate him, quote him or not, right. The guy paved the way, but he learned from Jim Rohn. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Jim Rohn learned, from, like you said, I'm saying it's like the deal is, is at, people at that level, top 5%, top 1% have eight to 12 life mastery skills. I mean, I'm sorry, not life mastery, mastery level skills. However, only 22% of them share it with somebody else. So they leave this earth after, after accumulating wealth, mm -hmm. after traveling all over the world and doing all kinds of fun stuff and, you know, Cal, was it Kalimanjaro and you know whatever in Belize and okay flying on private airplanes back and forth and you see them on the Instagrams and they're driving their Ferraris around and they're flying you know they're got to make sure I get the I got the picture in front of my airplane and you know kind of thing and I probably shouldn't say that or, ah I think we know who you're talking about your friend down in Florida <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the question becomes I have zero problem with people earning wealth. I have zero, I'm personally, personally, I have zero proper uh, problem with people earning that wealth as a result of serving well. The, the tricky part is, is did you affect the life in such a way that had you not been there, life would have been different. Jim Rohn poured into Tony. Tony's affected millions upon millions of people. Some of them went on to be incredibly high performers. Some of them didn't. That's where the choice lies, right? You can teach all the principles you want, but you can't make anybody take action, right? So all of that rolled up into one to say, you just got to keep going. If you feel like giving up, just keep going. Just keep going. Take one more step. Wasn't that something? <laughs> Steven's story can help us fight our own uphill battles in life. The three takeaways for me for this conversation were, well, number one, be willing to do today what others won't so you can have tomorrow what others don't. Number two, transform your life with baby steps. Don't think about the giant leaps. And number three, prepare now for the challenges before the struggles come. You cannot operate in fear. Fear will keep you standing still and standing still is death. I just want to remind you, 
that I would appreciate it so much. If you went over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, leave us a comment. It would mean a lot to me. If you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe. And if you want to connect directly with me, you can find me on IG. Remember, those of us who have something to prove can show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You got to be bold and you must say yes. Why? Because you, me, all of us, we do hard things. <laughs>